Well, this morning I want to speak to you about hope for hard times. Hope for hard times. I want to share in an age of controversial statements, <laughs> I want to share something that I don't feel is too, too controversial, right? That is this. Life is hard. Amen? Life is, like, does anyone have the t-shirt? Life is hard. I mean, that's like not a t-shirt, you know what I'm saying? Like, you may not have that t-shirt, but you're like wearing it underneath the shirt or jacket or whatever you got on today. It's like, we already know life is hard. We know that when we look at our bank account or sometimes lack thereof, or we have these beautiful little children that never sleep, life is hard. We know that when the job search seems to never end or the relationship struggles have no end in sight, life is hard. And this doesn't include the even sometimes heavier moments of those that we love that are in the throes of addiction and can't seem to find their way out. Or those that we love who are struggling with a debilitating, perhaps even terminal illness. Life is hard. And as we come to the book of Zechariah, we find that life was hard for the people in Jerusalem. You see, they had been carried off away from home hundreds and hundreds of miles away into Babylonia where they were held in captivity, oppressed for 70 years. And then when they received permission from the Persian king Darius to return to their city, Persia then took over Babylon. And when they came back and they started to rebuild their city, life didn't get that much better. But, but maybe this is why. <laughs> maybe this is why God sent them visionary messages. Because when we receive a visionary message from God, that visionary message from God is loaded with hope. God speaks hope for hard times by sending his word, sending his truth. And for Zechariah, it showed up as we're going to begin to see this morning in chapter one in a series of eight visions. Now, this is wild. Some, some scholars believe that what we're going to read about these night visions, that some of, them, some of them believe that they came all in one night. Now, we don't know that conclusively from the book, but whether they came all in one night or in a series of consecutive nights in a short period of time, we know that Zechariah was receiving supernatural revelation that God gave him to give to his people. Now, since we're about to cover the first vision this morning, I want to speak to my Bible geniuses just for a moment, all right? Because my Bible geniuses and those of you who are growing to become such, all right, hopefully that's all of us here today, um, you would be interested to know that these eight visions form a chiastic structure. And you're like, what is that? Some of you English teachers know what a chiasm is. It's a po poetry or a literary device even that can take up whole books where the first vision and the eighth, vi eighth vision have a similar message and theme. And then verses, uh, visions two through and seven have similar content and messaging. And, and then... Uh, Three and six, thank you, Jesus, for helping me with my math today. Three and six have similar visions and then ultimately pointing us to four and five where we get to Zechariah three and four, it's four and five are in chapters three and four where it centers on the rebuilding of the temple that God is going to work through 
the high priest Joshua and the governor Zerubbabel. So I want to lead us into the first vision here. And there is a lot that we are going to be able to take away from these verses today. This is what Zechariah writes. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem? And the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these 70 years. And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. And I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts. My cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again Comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. I need you to feel what these people would have been feeling as they began to receive these visions. If you can imagine. In fact, this was crazy last night. <laughs> this is in my notes. Uh, last night, I'm, I'm looking over my notes for this morning, trying to be fully prepared so I can give you some good business this morning. And I am hearing in, in North Medford, I don't know if there's anyone around there, maybe, maybe kind of west side of Malta, I'm hearing like, boom, 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 boom. Anyone see some heads nodding? They were like, I'm like, is America under attack here with all the craziness in our world? We trust our Coast Guard and Air Force and we're protected, fam. But... I mean, you know how you have these thoughts. It's like, what is going on here? I even see my ring app popping up. What's going on around here? And it's like, thank you, Jesus, there were fireworks, <laughs> right? So the fireworks are going crazy. But can you imagine if those weren't fireworks? If there were literally bombs coming into our city and the Hancock Tower is in ruins and the Pru has fallen on top of the public library and the city is in rubble. It's a scary, scary thought. But this is, listen, this is what happened in Jerusalem. The city was broken down. It had been besieged by King Nebuchadnezzar. We read about in the book of Daniel and, and the Babylonians carried off so many thousands upon thousands of the people of Israel. 
And so as we hear these words this morning, we need to hear them with the weight of the heaviness that these people were feeling as they, yeah, thank, thank God they had a wall around the city, but that was about it. No temple, no place of worship. You can see the ruins still all around the city. And it's into this situation and circumstance that God speaks this vision. And this vision gives us what? Hope for hard times. So I want to give you four encouragements that you can take with you based on the character and the work of God. That whatever you're going through, listen, what, I'm going to say, whatever you're going through, this right here is a word for you. This is a word for you. Number one, when you feel forgotten. <laughs> Anybody ever feel forgotten? Anyone ever feel overlooked? Listen, when you feel forgotten, God sees it all. I want to take you into this story just a little bit. You see, this story, this vision comes in a moment of time. This was February 15th, 519 BC. God comes to Zechariah. And this is one of the reasons why if you ask me, oh, Pastor Tanner, you always have your Bible, but you always have this little brown book with you too. Why is that? That's called my journal. And I walk with God and write it down. I don't write long, you know, triple paragraph prayers, and sometimes I do, but that's very rare. But what I do is I write down prayers, and I write down what I'm seeing God do around me because I believe that every day should be an adventure in the Spirit, that God can come and show up, and He does because the Holy Spirit is real, and He wants to speak to us, and He wants to walk with us, and He wants to lead us. And so, hey, thank you for getting excited this morning. You can clap back, talk back, say amen, hallelujah, preach Pastor T, whatever you need to do. But God's coming to Zechariah with a word. And this word comes in visions. In this first vision, there are four main characters. The first is this man on a red horse. And the, the 11th verse of the chapter says that this man on the red horse is none other than the angel of the Lord. Now, we encounter the angel of the Lord in a lot of other places in the Old Testament, like Genesis 18 and Joshua chapter 5 and Judges 6. And in all of those places, it is indicating that this is none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And so God is visiting Zechariah, and he's giving him a vision of the angel of the Lord. And then behind the angel of the Lord, there are these red and sorrel. That means kind of spotted. You've seen spotted horses before with different brown and white colors and also white horses. And uh, they have angelic riders on them. But then we have another angel, and this is the angel that was sent as God's messenger to give Zechariah these visions, to help him understand what is unfolding before his eyes. And then we have, of course, Zechariah the prophet himself. And Zechariah does what you and I would do in the same situation. He's seeing the man on the red horse. He's got the white dappled and uh, red horses behind them. He's they're in the myrtle trees. What's up with that? And he's like, what's going on? That's, that's my translation. It's pretty close to what the Bible actually says. What are these? What are these? And what's interesting is rather than the angel who is speaking with him, answering his question, it's the man on the red horse who answers his question. And he says, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Now, here's why this is significant, all right? This is like extra significant as we understand what's happening in the Persian Empire at that time. You see, Persia had conquered Babylon and all other kingdoms within striking distance. And so they were ruling the world at that time. And one of the ways that they were so effective militaristically is because they had special ops. Now you're thinking of your favorite Netflix movie, especially the men in the room, right? It's like, oh, we got this for the terminal list. And yeah, if you ever watched 24 back in the day, Jack Bauer, that dude was a bad guy. He was a special op. And it's like their special ops were everywhere. In fact, they were called, they were nicknamed the eyes and ears of the king. 
And so they were like our CIA. They had intelligence that was gathering information all over the world that helped them win and keep their military ground. But, but, but can you see what's going on here? God is saying this, yo, Persia, you got your special ops. Well, guess what? I got my own. And my special ops don't just get into selective spots around your kingdom, but my special ops go throughout the whole earth. They patrol the earth. In other words, my eyes are everywhere. God sees everything. Every detail of history, past, present, and future, God sees it all. And if God sees all of that, then when it comes to me and you, in our microscopic lives, God sees all of the details of our story too, past, present, and future. When you feel, fam, when you feel overlooked, somebody's feeling overlooked today, someone's feeling forgotten, someone's feeling isolated, someone's feeling forsaken, maybe you've had relational friction and now you're off by yourself. Listen, God sees you. He sees you. He loves you. One of the most touching stories in the Bible is about a woman named Hagar. This woman was an Egyptian slave, single mom, who was abused in the home she was working in and then had to flee for her life. And as she's on the run, the Bible says in Genesis 16 that she is scared and alone, sitting by a desert spring, and guess who shows up? God. God shows up and he speaks words of comfort and encouragement to her. And her response to God is this, you are El Roy, the God who sees me. The God who sees me. She is the first person in the Bible to give God a name. And he is still El Roy. Listen, he sees you. He sees you in your heart. He sees you in your challenges. He sees you in your trials. He sees you when you don't have much. He sees you when everything seems to be falling apart. When you feel forgotten, God sees it all. But then number two, when you feel defeated, and these, these people were feeling more than defeated. They were still under Persian rule. They were still oppressed. When you feel defeated, God has all power. Verse 11 is very interesting. Look at this. It says, these are, are, are those that the Lord has sent to patrol all the earth. Verse 10, now verse 11. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Now on the surface, you would think for a people that had experienced war and being carried off into exile, this is good news. The world is at rest. Thank you. And even because the Bible said multiple times that you will build the temple at a time where you are experiencing rest. And so we're like, oh, that's another good thing. But this, this rest refers to the rest of the pagan nations, that they are at ease, that they have peace, that they are the ones that are in control. And so this is why, let's not forget about the man on the red horse, the angel of the Lord cries out in verse 11, and he says this, God, Lord of hosts, this is a lament, just like we have in the psalm so many times. How long? How long will you not show mercy to your people? They've been in exile for these 70 years. And it's into this moment that God speaks and he sends the angel to give Zechariah gracious and comforting words. Now, another little 
note for my Bible geniuses. This is very much an echo of what we have in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, which is the post-exilic prophecies of what is going to come after they would be carried off into exile, which was also prophesied. And so verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah 40 say what? Comfort. Comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Wow. And so the angel shows up to Zechariah and he says, hey, here's your message. And by the way, just as an aside, I wish my sermon prep was like this. You know, it's like angel, hey, this. I mean, sometimes it's like, it's almost that supernatural. It's like, boom, outline. Thank you, Jesus. Bring some more of that. But Zechariah gets the exact words. And what are they? Listen, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. He says, cry out, shout for all to hear you, Zechariah. You don't have the nice, you know, QSR speakers, but I need you to raise your voice and keep walking block to block and share this news. The Lord is exceedingly jealous for you, Jerusalem. Every person in the city had to hear this message. And it's my joy today to tell you that God's heart hasn't changed for any one of us here in this room. God is jealous for you. He's more jealous for you than another man or woman could ever be for you. James 4, 5 says, do, do, do you not know? Have you not read the scriptures that says that he yearns jealously over the spirit he has caused to dwell in you? So that's why you don't be a friend with the world and dabble in all these types of things. God is jealous for you. He loves you. He wants your devotion because he is giving you his what? Complete devotion. This is why the NLT puts it like this. My love for you is passionate and strong. God loves you like that. He does. And he's inviting us back into that same kind of love expression. Listen, if you feel like you are kind of running on fumes spiritually, if you feel like your tank is low, you do not need to feel bad about that. You do not need to feel guilty. I mean, maybe there are some things that God is speaking to you about and you're convicted about and you need to make some modifications. Of course, join the club. But wherever you are today, listen, God is coming towards you to meet you with his love and to give you all that you need to return to a greater place of loving devotion and passion back to him. Please believe that. He wants you to experience the fierceness of his love that your love might flow back to him in return in the same kinds of ways. And so first Zechariah, you know, get moving, start stepping because you got to tell people I'm exceedingly jealous for them, but also you need to let these nations know. I mean, what would it have been like for the Persian, you know, commanders and, and these people to hear that, hey, y Yahweh, he's exceedingly not jealous for you, he's angry with you. And God describes his anger in the same way that he describes his jealousy. He's exceedingly jealous. He's exceedingly angry. And why is he angry? Because the Bible says that though he was angry but a little with his people, they furthered the disaster. So let me explain this. God had called his people to live in a covenant love relationship. And this is all detailed out at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. So he warned them. If you do not live according to my ways, you are going to miss out on my blessing. And not only that, but because I love you so much, like a good parent will discipline their child. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, no more screen time because you aren't listening and I need to help you listen. So I'm going to take away that screen time. We're going to reduce it. We're going to have some extra chores. Hallelujah, parents. You know, you're the authority in the home and you can still do these kind of things, by the way. And uh, they're not, like, kids were awesome, but they're not the authority. You're the authority. And so it's like, God is this perfect parent. 
And he's saying, listen, you're my children, but if you, if you live in such a way that is going to be harmful to you, I'll do whatever I have to do to get your attention. But, but my anger with you is, is in the scheme of, of eternity, in the scheme of my love. It's, a, it's just a little anger. Now, it's hard for us to consider 70 years in exile, that's a little anger? All we can say is God is eternal and he paints on a different canvas than we paint when it comes to what we need to wake us up and to help us see and to live differently and to give that on to generation after generation. But if God's loving discipline to bring his people back was but a little, he says, to the nations who have, I've allowed to come in and I've allowed them to win a military victory, in my allowance of them winning this victory, listen, they took it way too far. They took it way too far. They abused and oppressed and hurt my people in a way that was exceedingly evil. And that's why I am exceedingly angry. And so I hope you see how two things can be true at the same time, that God is disciplining his people through allowing the Babylonians and then the Persians to rule over them. And yet the Babylonians and the Persians were abusing their power in unjust ways, and God is not pleased with them either. In fact, this was brought home to me just yesterday reading my Bible Saturday morning when Paul says, a messenger from Satan was sent to me to torment me. But God used the torment to make sure that I wouldn't become too proud. Two things can be true at the same time. And everything that's going on here reminds us of the words. You might want to write this down in your notes. Psalm 30, verse 5. This is so good. God says there that my anger lasts for a moment, but my favor lasts for a lifetime. God's anger lasts for a moment, but my favor lasts for a lifetime. This is exactly what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, where he says, the Lord, the Lord, he reveals his name, uh, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, showing steadfast love to thousands of generations, but punishing the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth. God angry? God judging, third and fourth, love to thousands. Man, our God is pretty gracious and good. Amen? It's amazing. And we're so thankful. So these nations, they're at ease, but God is saying you have a false comfort. And you have a false comfort because I hold the ultimate and complete power in every situation. And, and I want you to see this. This is like, we might miss this if we move too fast. What calls down God's power? God is sovereign. He does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But God has chosen to use what? Our prayers to call down his power. Verse 11, there is an angel of the Lord praying. And what is he doing? He is interceding for the people. And this reminds us that Jesus Christ right now, Romans 8, 34 says that he is at the right hand of the Father and he is making intercession for us right now. You, he's interceding for you. Robert Murray Machine said this, I love this. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. But distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Therefore, I can move forward with all kinds of confidence. Amen. Amen. Come on, the church. Like, this is like, oh, we can't, like, this is, uh, this is crazy truth. Our God sees us. Our God has the power. And number three, when you feel forsaken, God is always present. We said that the city is in ruins. The glory and presence of God felt absence. But verse 16 says what? Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. With mercy. 
verse 16 is God's answer to the prayer of verse 12. How, how long no mercy? Oh, there's a, there's, there's a time limit. Because when I, when I come back into the city, my mercy is coming with me. Amen? Wow. God brings his mercy. Maybe a better translation of the word that we would process is compassion. God brings his compassion. He, he brings his compassion in a way that meets the physical needs of his people, but his compassion is not just answering by physical action, but it is also deeply emotional. God is the kind of God who suffers alongside his people. When we hurt, God hurts. When we rejoice, God rejoices. In fact, the etymology of compassion means to suffer with. That's what it means, compassion. And this is what we have. What makes Christianity different from every other world religions is that we have a God who has come to us who has walked more than a mile in our shoes, who has suffered not just with us, but suffered for us. Jesus Christ. Mark Boda, scholar, says this, the message of the prophets has been one of reciprocal turning. What, what did God promise in verse three last week? We saw it. Return to me and I will what? I will return to you. In other words, when you, when you turn, when you shoot, when you get back to a way of life that reflects who I am and you return to me in that way, then I will return to you with my favor and blessings and presence. I hope you've walked with God long enough, fam, to know that there is something different when God is in the room. There's something different. Have you, have you been in a home where there's no sensible presence of the blessing of God? Have you been in a conversation where this like, oh, it's just like everything seems to be hitting a wall here? But there's something totally different when you know God is everywhere, right? He is everywhere. And that's the, that's the point here is God is everywhere. He was there in Persia. He was there in Babylon. He is here now. But when God's there to show who he is, when he is there to bless and to reveal his love to his people, everything is different. Everything is different. Listen, I dare you for whatever hard you're going through to just take some time, maybe turn on some worship music, and maybe bow your head, maybe even just be bold enough to hit your knees for, for a, a period of time and say, God, I am asking you to walk into this room right now and speak to me and help me and encourage me and speak words of comfort to me and show me, God, who you are again because I'm feeling a little distant, I'm feeling a little forsaken, I'm feeling a little defeated, I'm feeling like no one really cares about me, but God, you said you did so would you walk into the room again and show me how great you are God loves to do it he absolutely loves to do it I hope you've sensed the presence of heaven in this room today because I sure have fam this is so so good and so what is the result then what is the result of his presence the result of his presence is then number four his goodness when you feel hopeless God is always good. As Jerusalem is coming out of their ruins, this is unlike anything you've ever seen on HGT, be it Fixer Upper, Good Bones, Hometown, whatever. It's like this is, this is more than a, a simple restoration project. But when God steps back into the city, he starts saying things like this in verse 16, my house will be built. And what he's talking about is the temple. The temple was the place of their worship. The temple was the center point of their devotion and celebration. The temple was their place of consecration to say, we belong to God. The temple was the place where the law was given and received and where forgiveness was found. 
All of these things were happening at God's house where he manifested his presence in a very, very special way as people drew near to him with humility to worship him just like we've done today. This is really, really encouraging news. The temple's going to be rebuilt. But not only that, he says then twofold that the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. And so if you, if you know anything about building buildings, my father-in-law was a contractor. My mother-in-law is still a drafts woman. And what I know is that there is few things more exciting, especially if you're in that line of work, than a blueprint. Because a blueprint gives the precise design and dimension for that thing that is not yet, but that will be. And that's what's going on here. God says, you do step one in a building project. You get your, you get your tape measure, but your tape measure got to be longer than the 25 variety foot variety that you get at Home Depot. I mean, I need you to get a long, 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 a long one because this one is stretching from Lowell to the South Shore. Like, it's just like, it's, it's stretching out because what? I am going to cause this city to overflow in prosperity. There is a blessing coming where not just a physical prosperity and yes, now we have houses and we have food on the table. Thank you, Jesus. But we also are being comforted again by the Lord. We are being chosen again by the Lord. How many times in verse 17 do you see the word again, 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 again? I just gave it to you. Again, it's four times. Again, 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 again. This is all covenantal language that God is faithful to keep his promises. He's faithful to pour out his goodness on his people again. And if you're anything like me, you long to see more. You long to see these things happen. And yet often it's like, oh, we're not there yet. We're like the kids in the backseat of a road trip, right? Parents, huh? How much longer until we get there? And scholars call this an unrealized eschatology. Eschatology means final things, what's coming in the very end. And, and their hopes for what is coming in the very end aren't there yet. But God says, look, you can trust that they're coming. They are on the way. They are as good as right at your feet. Why? Because I am the omni God. Did you catch it in the outline? I dropped a little something for you if you were paying attention. God is the omni God. He is what? Omni Omniscient, thank you, say it like that. Omniscient, he sees everything, he knows everything. God is omnipotent, he has all power. God is omnipresent, he is everywhere present at all times. And God is this one, sometimes we forget it, he is omnibenevolent. He is always good. That's why when we say God is good, you say it like Forrest Frank. All the time, say it like, you don't have to say it like Forrest Frank, never mind. Um, He's good all the time. And so listen, my prayer for you is that you have known and tasted the goodness of God. Wherever you are, God says, you have no reason to doubt my goodness. And if we ever doubt for a second, which we will, which we do, we just come back to the good news of the gospel because God says this in Romans 8.32, for if God who did not spare his own son, but graciously gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God would send his son for you and give you not just the goodest gift, but the greatest gift, haha, there is nothing that he will not do for you there is no way that he won't show up in your life no matter how hard it is because he loves you like that.